Today we're going to have Tierney Sutton and Serge Marlowe start us off with a song, and then that'll be followed by a quotation from Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're in um, Los Angeles, and uh, I wanted to share a song with you that maybe you've heard before. It's an old standard by Hoagy Carmichael and the lyricist Johnny Mercer, but it also has sort of a mystical meaning in that um, the idea of the skylark or the nightingale is an image of the great mystical teachers that teach us where God is. So if you listen to this lyric with that sensibility, it might give you a different kind of meaning. So this is Skylark. stated, to be a Baha'i simply means to love all the world, to love humanity and to try to serve it, to work for universal peace and universal brotherhood. Well, thank you so much to Tierney and Serge. That was really beautiful. So we're going to introduce our speaker now and please remember to save all your questions until after the talk when we have our Q&A session. This week's speaker is Mr. Rain Wilson, and he will be speaking on why I am a Baha'i. Rain Wilson is best known for playing the role of Dwight Schrute on NBC's The Office. Additional film and television credits include Galaxy Quest, Almost Famous, The Rocker, Super, Six Feet Under, Juno, Backstrom, Star Trek Discovery, Tom Paine, The Meg, Mom, and Don't Tell a Soul. 
He will also be appearing in the forthcoming series, Utopia and the Power. Wilson co-founded Soul Pancake, a digital media company, and the Lied Foundation, an educational initiative in rural Haiti that empowers at-risk women and girls through the arts. And with that, I'll hand it off to Rain. Thank you, Parahami family. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see you all. Well, to see some of you still getting used to um, these Zoom meetings. And I see some of the kids from my Saturday morning children's class, my Baha'i children's class. Are you out there, some of you? Can you raise your hand? Great. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Who else is there? Other folks? There's other people out there. I think they're being shy. Um, I'm putting them on the spot. So I invited my uh, children uh, from the children's class to come. So listen. I'm looking through the gallery and I'm seeing that there's a lot of Baha'is on here. Uh, that's wonderful, welcome. Um, and there might be uh, folks that know a fair amount about the Baha'i faith. There's probably a lot of folks that know a lot more about the Baha'i faith than I do. And, um, and then there might be some people who have no idea what this weird sounding religion is and, um, and wanna learn a little bit about it. So. I'm mostly speaking to those folks today. Um, so let me start by just giving a, a brief little rundown on what the Baha'i Faith is, a brief introduction, and then I'll go a little bit into my personal story. And like they said, the, the title of today's talk is Why I Am a Baha'i. And so I'm just going to speak uh, from my heart and from my story. I'm gonna share some quotes. I'm going to haltingly and faultingly share my PowerPoint presentation. I'm terrible at PowerPoint. And I don't know how to share it on Zoom very well, but I'm gonna do my best. So pray for me. If they're Baha'is, pray for me that I use my PowerPoint effectively. Um, so the Baha'i faith is the newest of the world's religions and essentially believes that there is only one God and that all the different religious faiths essentially worship this one all knowing, all encompassing creative force in the universe. And that this one God uh, in his infinite wisdom has decided to educate humanity through sending down specially appointed divine teachers every once in a while, every 500,000 years in various point, points of the world. He sends down divine teachers bringing God's message to help humanity mature over time, eventually, um, uh, systematically. So these divine teachers, you've probably heard of a lot of them, um, going way, way back to Krishna and Abraham, and then moving forward a little bit to the Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad. And there's many more uh, throughout the world and they all essentially bring the same message. You might say, well, Buddhism and Islam are so different. How can they come from the same source? How can that be? But if you look at the essential message uh, of Muhammad or of the Buddha, it's one of selfless service to others. It's one of devotion. It's one of non-attachment to the material world, uh, service to something larger than ourselves. Um, and humanity takes that uh, essential message from these teachers and kind of corrupts it in some ways, uses it culturally um, and applies it culturally in the, in the, in the time and the place uh, that they live. And that's why it needs to be refreshed. This is an ever refreshing message from God. And Baha'is are believers in all of these world's religions. So if you've ever wondered like, wow, I wish I could be a Christian and also believe in the Buddha, or I wish I could be a Christian and read the Bhagavad Gita, or I wish I could be Jewish and love the Quran. Well, this is a way to do that, to see them all as part of God's ongoing continuous revelation 
as Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith said, it's the ancient faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. So Baha'is believe that the newest of these divine teachers was named Baha'u'llah, went by the title Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. And that um, he lived in Persia, in Iran in the mid 19th century. Um, I'm not going to go a lot into the history, but he suffered tremendously, was banished, wrote hundreds and hundreds of books, some mystical in nature, some more kind of almost sociological, embracing the, the current world moment. And that's what Baha'is believe that the teachings of Baha'u'llah uh, are for this day and age. So with that, I'll get started. There's my nice graphic, courtesy of Microsoft. So a lot of my kids from my Saturday morning children's class are here. We've been having a really great time the last month or so. And I grew up a Baha'i. My parents became a Baha'i um, in the late 60s. And um, that's when I was born. And so I grew up into this milieu and I was taught all kinds of wonderful things about the Baha'i faith, about spirituality, about humanity. <clears throat> what I just went over the unity of God, of religion, of humanity. Because if there is only one God and all these divine teachers come from the same source and there really is only one religion. And if we look at humanity on a globe, on a planet, then there's one humanity, which is a very recent development. This is really only something in the last century that people have started to, to see like, oh, this isn't about being Bolivian or Bulgarian or Mongolian, this is about all of us with the shared resources on this planet. We all have different colored skin, different background, um, different creeds, different social classes, cultures, what have you, but we're all one humanity. So growing up it was with this wonderful uh, uh, idea, these were wonderful concepts as a child to grow up with some of these principal teachings of the Baha'i faith, the equality of women and men, the elimination of racial prejudice is key. It's, it, you know, Baha'is were in the Black Lives Matter movement like way before uh, anyone else. Uh, the elimination of racial prejudice is so crucially important in the United States, but all over the world. And uh, this was a teaching of Baha'u'llah and later his son, Abdul Baha, from back um, in the 19th century. The harmony of science and religion, the fact that right now, there's kind of the, the secular left pro-science is a little bit, can, can be a little anti-religion. And then the religious right division in the United States, I'm just speaking of the current moment, of course, can be kind of pro-religion and very distrustful of science. And sometimes anti-science if they feel it goes against the Bible, let's say. And there's these two sides butting heads. Well, Baha'is believe that these two sides really can and should come together, that we can have religious faith and we can have the divinity of a book like the Bible work hand in hand and in total harmony with the discoveries of science. The elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty is a crucial Baha'i teaching and universal education. These are just some of the teachings I grew up with uh, as a kid in the Baha'i faith. This is a quote that the first day I had my children's class I taught these kids because it's one of my favorite Baha'i quotes. And if I leave you with anything today over this hour, I hope that this quote stays with you. The betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. You know, it's, um, there's not a lot of hope these days, especially among young people. And this is one of the reasons why I think this quote is so important as it provides us with hope. A lot of people feel like the betterment of the world cannot be accomplished. That's true. They really believe that. They don't know if we'll be able to uh, fix racism. They don't know if we'll be able to fix climate change. They don't know if we'll ever be able to come together in unity or if we'll always be in division. A lot of people believe, well, men are essentially just animals and they're just at each other's throats and will never come together in harmony. Um, so there's a lot of pessimism out there, especially among young people. And here's Baha'u'llah saying 150 years ago, the betterment of the world can be accomplished 
through two things, and I'll go over my kids if you're listening, through pure and goodly deeds, right? So that's what you do, your deeds, and through commendable and seemly conduct and how you do those deeds. It's not enough to do the deeds, um, to do good deeds, um, but to bring your character um, and your your courtesy and kindness and lovingness and open-heartedness as you're doing it, just like Lord Jesus did, just like Lord Buddha did um, in their own way. So I talked a little bit about progressive revelation. This is, this is a handy dandy graphic I found for my beautiful slideshow, courtesy of Baha'iTeachings.org. Shows the kind of like the rays of the sun from one God, all of these divine teachers coming down. Um, why do I have this ridiculous graphic? Because it reminds me of my father who was a Baha'i and he was a great Baha'i teacher and he passed away recently this last year of heart disease. Um, and because we were always including people of all different faiths in our home and in our discussions, if Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or whomever would knock on the door, my dad would invite them in and we would read the Bible together. And I remember as a kid one time, he invited some folks in and they, he said, um, he said, hey, what do you guys think about uh, the kingdom of God on earth? And uh, how does that work? And they said, well, there's going to be a great rumbling and thunder and the sky is going to split open and this beautiful city of silver and gold is going to descend from above and um, on it are going to be the angels and then all the saved people will go up on the kingdom and it will float away. Jesus will be there with horns and trumpets and whatnot and it will float away. And that's the, how the kingdom of God is going to work. And they said, what do Baha'is believe about the kingdom of God on earth? And my dad said, well, it's similar. You know, there's thunder and lightning and the sky is going to split open. And then down from the sky is going to come um, some bags of cement, some shovels, uh, sand, nails, staples, flashing. And down from the sky will float this single piece of paper and it'll say, kingdom of God on earth, build it yourself kit. And so this is how Baha'is see uh, the kingdom of God on earth. Um, uh, not a bunch of white catalog models standing around in hard hats in a, in a graphic that I pulled off of the internet in 20 seconds, but people getting together and working at it and working hand in hand and side by side. Um, so, to continue on in my life story of why I am a Baha'i, this was a wonderful upbringing. And then I um, decided to, long story short, I decided to become an actor, I auditioned for acting schools when I was in college and I went off to New York City in the late 80s to study acting. And at that point in time, I really jettisoned the Baha'i faith. I didn't want anything to do with religious faith um, or morality or, or, the, or the faith of my parents. I wanted to make my own way in the big city and be an artist. And um, I wrote a book about my life, which I won't, it's back there somewhere, I won't plug right now. Um, but if you want the longer story, you can, you can look there. But essentially, um, my biggest dream of my life was to become an actor and a working actor. And and I succeeded at that. I went to acting school. I got an agent. I started working in the theater around New York City and uh, working with some really great directors. And I always kind of thought, like, once I achieve status as a working actor, then I will be happy. I never was that happy beforehand. And then this very strange thing happened to me personally, which was I was... Uh, working as an actor. I had a great apartment in Brooklyn. I was with my my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. We've been together for 30 years. And, and yet, I was not happy. 
Um, and this didn't make sense to me because everything in the American culture says like, well, you suffer through school and then you suffer through getting training. And then once you get your career and you make some money and maybe you get a house and you get your right romantic partner, then you will be happy. That's when, that's when satisfaction kicks in. And I didn't find this to be the case. Here I was living my dream. I was this kind of poor suburban boy from Seattle and um, no one I knew had ever been a professional artist or made a dime doing art. And I had moved to New York and gotten training and was working as a professional actor. This was beyond my wildest dreams or, or anyone's dreams that I knew. And yet I was deeply, deeply unhappy. And I had a lot of struggles in my twenties. And I think essentially for me, um, uh, those struggles led me back to my faith. So um, I dealt with a lot of mental health issues during the time, um, a lot of anxiety. I had terrible anxiety attacks for years, crippling anxiety attacks, uh, depression um, and addiction issues, and many things that sent me looking for some kind of deeper meaning in my life. It was not just enough for me to have a, an awesome van and an awesome apartment in Brooklyn and be working as, as an actor. There was something deeply unsettled and un, unsatisfied in my heart. And that's when I came around to back to the Baha'i faith. Long story, very, very short version of a long story was I thought perhaps I had thrown away too much when I threw away all of religion. At the time, I was essentially an atheist and had thrown away any belief in God or morality or anything higher than that, even though I had those wonderful teachings that I grew up with as a, as a child. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I was being too hasty. Maybe there is some answer in the world of spirituality that can address these issues that I'm having personally, that I'm feeling in my heart. So something about mental health. And I wanna say that these mental health issues are very strong today in young people. I think people of the older generation really have no idea how uh, deep these mental health issues run with young folk. Suicide, over half of college students have had suicidal ideation. Suicide attempts are at about a third, uh, especially with young men, believe it or not. Uh, with young teens, it's more in the girls. Uh, anxiety, over half of college students say that they have some kind of anxiety that is debilitating. Uh, depression is up. All of these numbers are especially up over the last eight to 15 years, uh, due in large part to the increased use of screens and social media and disconnection that that creates. But more, that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole different talk. So, um, but for, for folks over... 50 or 60, they need to know that this mental health epidemic is very, very serious. And one of the ways that when I came back around to exploring the Baha'i faith, uh, I found some very beautiful prayers, some writings and some meditations that brought a great deal of solace to my heart. And here is a, here is a prayer that I'll just say right now that brought me a lot of solace at the time. O oh God, refresh and gladden my spirit. Purify my heart. Illumine my powers. I lay all my affairs in thy hand. Thou art my guide and my refuge. I will no longer be sorrowful and grieved. I will be a happy and joyful being. O oh God, I will no longer be full of anxiety, nor will I let trouble harass me. I will not dwell on the unpleasant things of life. O oh God, thou art more friend to me than I am to myself. I dedicate myself to thee, O oh Lord. As I started coming back into the Baha'i faith, I had an opportunity, and this might resonate with a lot of the young people listening today. I had an opportunity to rediscover the Baha'i faith on my own terms and not on my parents' terms. And that required me reading all the Baha'i books. So I spent several years reading all of them from top to bottom, every single book I could get my hands on. Dawnbreakers, 
the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, Katabi Gone, Gleanings. I, I read through every single one of them and studied every one. And this allowed me to kind of build a foundation that was my own and not based upon the faith of my parents. And as I did this, I discovered some key teachings. And this is again, why am I a Baha'i? Because of some of these key teachings that I discovered in my late 20s, early 30s in this phase of my life. One of them was this Baha'i teaching that art is the same as worship. This was really revelatory for me. It was mind blowing. This idea that art was a form of worship. I rejoice, this is, oh, I didn't put his name down, but this is Abdul Baha who said this quote, the son of, of Baha'u'llah, got cut off somewhere, sorry. I rejoice to hear that thou hast taken pains with thine art, for in this wonderful new age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. What bestowal could be greater than this, that one's art, should be even as the act of worshiping the Lord. That is to say, when thy fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if thou wert at prayer in the temple. How amazing is that? When your fingers grasp the paintbrush, it is as if you were at prayer in the temple. So all of those years I spent doing theater and building my career and trying to be an actor, that was all worship. This is a bestowal from Baha'u'llah for this new revelation, for this new spiritual springtime of humanity is that art is the same as worship. Now I could do a whole talk on art as worship. There's, it's something that really fires me up and there's a number of incredible ideas behind that. Uh, first and foremost, that God is the creator and that as we create, we create a pot, a painting, a poem, a dance, a song, a play, that we're emulating that divine impulse to create something beautiful. So this really resonated with me and said, oh, I don't, to become a Baha'i or to be spiritual, I don't need to leave my art. As a matter of fact, I need to dive into my art even more and recognize my art as worship. Art is also service. As we heard Tierney and Serge play that beautiful song this morning and it calmed our hearts and it soothed us and it opened our hearts and it brought up memories and, we were touched by the sweetness and beauty of the song. It's a beautiful service to create art as well. The other aspect uh, was the independent investigation of truth, which um, was a very key concept in the Baha'i faith that I didn't bring up previously. And uh, this is a, one of the key pillar teachings of the Baha'i faith that we need to find the truth for ourselves. And that's what I had done. I had gone you know, on this journey, I had mental health struggles. I had great difficulties. I uh, was very unhappy, but I came back to the Baha'i faith, found the truth for myself, and that Baha'u'llah writes about the importance of every person finding the truth for themselves. This might sound obvious in this day and age. Well, duh, you find the truth for yourself, you know. But in the 19th century, this was a revolutionary concept. Even in the 1950s, this was a revolutionary concept. That was always accepted that you had, you took on the truth of your parents. If your parents went to that synagogue, you went to that synagogue. If your parents went to that church, you went to that church. If they went to that mosque, you went to that mosque. If your grandfather was a cobbler and your father was a cobbler, then you were gonna be a cobbler. It wasn't any kind of like, I'm gonna take a gap year and I'm gonna go kayaking and try meditation for a while. and. This whole idea was a completely foreign concept up until 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, but I realized that this was a spiritual journey that I was on that was essentially okayed by Baha'u'llah. It was uh, included in the key spiritual writings of the Baha'i faith. I'm gonna just say a few more things and then we can take some questions. Why am I Baha'i? There's a series of books called the Ruhi books that are wonderful study guides to the Baha'i faith. Um, and uh, there's, boy, there's like 11, 13 of them now. There's a lot of, a lot of these books uh, to study and you can learn a great deal. You can find Baha'is in your community to 
to study these books, but book five is about teaching youth classes. And it goes into this concept at the beginning and it really kind of blew my mind. It's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty obvious when you look at it, but when you study it, um, at least when I studied it, um, I found it to be incredibly enlightening and exciting. And I had never really thought about one spiritual path being containing a twofold moral purpose before. So we talked about art the same as worship. We talked about the independent investigation of truth. And then this idea that we, when teaching youth, working with young people, we stress this idea of a twofold moral purpose. What does that mean? Well, on one hand, it's a personal, I put here my own words, personal path towards perfection of spiritual virtues, AKA enlightenment. And when most people think of spirituality, this is what they think of. Like I go to my yoga class and my yoga teacher has beautiful sayings by the Buddha and we meditate and it makes me feel really good. But when I meditate outside in the trees, I feel really connected to the universe. And um, this is my working on one's own inner garden, you know, um, in the Baha'i context, we look at it a little bit differently, similar, but there's a different thing to throw in there. And that's spiritual virtues. So for the Baha'is, uh, the, the culmination, no, the contribution, the, what is it? Cultivation, cultivation of spiritual virtues is one of the key meanings of why we're here. So long story short, God has all these incredible virtues, kindness, love, grace, power, patience, honesty, and all of those virtues of the divine are the virtues that we need to cultivate in ourselves, that we need to work on in ourselves. It's hard. It sucks. There's a lot for all of us that come really easy. Like for my wife, she's very empathetic, very compassionate person. For me, I'm extremely impatient. I can, I, patience, I, I have to work so hard to be patient with myself, with others, it, it, it's killing me, but I'm trying my best to cultivate that virtue of patience. So on the other hand of the twofold moral purpose is the external, uh, is the looking outward. And this is this part of the spiritual path that is not spoken about too much in contemporary America, either in contemporary Christian churches, even though Jesus exemplified this to a T, or in the kind of like new age potpourri um, grab bag of spirituality that can be found on meditation apps or yoga classes or inspiring quotes on Instagram. And that is selfless service to humanity. So this outward orientation, that part of our moral purpose, part of our spiritual purpose, part of our spiritual path is to serve others. And this includes social justice, working for great social justice, whatever that means to you, to make the world more just and equitable. And also it means community building, especially at the grassroots. Um, building community, well, we can go into that later. But so these two forces are at work in all of us. And for me, this really resonated. It all of a sudden kind of something really clicked in me, like, oh, I can do both of these things. I can pray and meditate and work on my virtues. I can connect with the divine. I can um, find that mystical union with both Baha'u'llah, with the prophets and pet messages of the past. I have my own personal uh, spiritual garden that I'm tending. And I also can try and make the world a better place. And that is part of my moral and spiritual purpose. Here's a big whopper of a quote. As we get deeper into the second part of that twofold moral purpose, the, uh, the administrative body that is, um, that is in, I don't want to say in charge of the Baha'i, that guides the Baha'i world um, is called the Universal House of Justice. These are nine elected people who live in the Baha'i Holy Land of Haifa, Israel. And this is a beautiful quote from the Universal House of Justice I wanted to share with you all about this second part of this twofold moral purpose. And this is, again, why am I a Baha'i? Because I want to make the world a better place. And this is part of my spiritual prerogative. 
the Universal House of Justice says, the key to resolving these social ills rests in the hands of a youthful generation convinced of the nobility of human beings, eagerly seeking a deeper understanding of the true purpose of existence, able to distinguish between divine religion and mere superstition, clear in the view of science and religion as two independent yet complementary systems of knowledge that propel human progress. Conscious of and drawn to the beauty and power of unity in diversity, secure in the knowledge that real glory is to be found in service to one's country and to the peoples of the world, and mindful that the acquisition of wealth is praiseworthy only insofar as it attained through just means and expended for benevolent purposes, for the promotion of knowledge and toward the common good. Thus must our precious youth prepare themselves to shoulder the tremendous responsibilities that await them. And thus will they prove immune to the atmosphere of greed that surrounds them and press forward unwavering in the pursuit of their exalted goals. I wish we had more time to really dig into this quote, but I wanted to just tease that this is what Baha'is all over the world are working on. Especially inspiring a youthful generation towards these selfless acts of service and making the world a better place, taking with them these key teachings of Baha'u'llah that I've been over earlier in the presentation. Here's not a Baha'i quote, but this is one of my favorite quotes from Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this sums up better than anything else why I'm a Baha'i. The current model of how things are done in the world is not working. I'm not just talking about partisan politics. I'm talking about a materialistic centered civilization and society. I'm talking about consu rampant consumerism. I'm talking about random desire and search for distraction through sc screens, games, and entertainment. I'm talking about the way that our society is based on uh, conflict, on contention, uh, on contest, winner takes all, uh, uh, survival of the fittest, competition and capitalism going hand in hand. Now, there's nothing wrong with, I'm not here to skewer capitalism, but I am here to skewer the underpinnings of capitalism, which is a kind of a winner take all, takes all uh, mentality. So this whole system built on this faulty structure is starting to collapse and we're seeing that more and more. So what the Baha'is are doing is attempting to build a whole new system, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that new model is a society built on spiritual principles, built on love, connection, service, and community. And finally, coming back to this quote that we started with, this quote that gives us all hope, the quote that I had my kids in my class memorize, the betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds and through commendable and seemly conduct. So I hope that gives you a sense of why I am a Baha'i. And um, I thank you very much for listening. And I did pretty good with the PowerPoint. So thank you for your prayers, Baha'is. I really, I kind of kicked butt with that PowerPoint. That's the best I've ever done by far. It was like, <laughs> so slick. Very, very smooth transition. <laughs> yeah. Well, so maybe we can take a few questions. I'm, I'm around, I'm not going anywhere. So thank you to all 285 of you and for the hundreds more that may be watching this video in the future after it's posted on YouTube. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Paimane. Thank you for taking the time to share your spiritual journey and experience. I think we all really enjoyed hearing that. So, okay, yes, yeah, so we'd love to have a Q&A portion. If you would just put your questions in the chat, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, the first question is from Liam. How does your faith influence your daily actions? Uh, thank you, Liam. 
So how does my faith influence my daily actions? Well, I'm going to go back to that twofold moral purpose. So my job when I wake up in the morning is to work on this twofold moral purpose. So I'm, I'm attempting, and this is why I'm a Baha'i. It reminds me of that, um, uh, that I am attempting to be, uh, to cultivate my spiritual virtues, to connect with God, to the universe, to nature, um, to grow spiritually, personally, and use those tools. And at the same time, I am also attempting to, through my work um, and through, you know, volunteerism and working with nonprofits and, and connecting with other people, I'm also attempting to uh, um, try and make the world a better place. Thank you. Our next question is from Trevor. As I started studying the Baha'i faith, I considered Rain and my friend Steve, I think Steve Sarowitz, proselytizers of the Baha'i faith. Would Rain consider himself one for the Baha'i faith for wanting people to become Baha'is? Um, thanks. Yes. Uh, so proselytizing is an interesting word because Baha'is are forbidden to proselytize. So hopefully I'm not proselytizing or seen as a proselytizer from its dictionary definition, which is um, an attempt to kind of convince and coerce someone uh, toward a belief. So Baha'is are not allowed to proselytize. Um, like for instance, this Zoom, we'd send out an invite. If people want to come to the Zoom and listen, then they're being, they want to learn more about the Baha'i faith or about people's spiritual journeys, that's fine. But that's a little different than me like, going and grabbing people and trying to convert them attempt. And, and by the way, this whole meeting right here is not an attempt to convert. If people want to become Baha'is, fabulous, wonderful. Join us in building this new spiritually grounded community building oriented civilization based on spiritual principles. You're welcome. We'd love to have you or learn more about it. Um, or keep your own beliefs, whatever they are, atheist, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, and work with us because we need people of all different beliefs to work together to build better, stronger communities based on love. So it's not about necessarily becoming a Baha'i. Our next question is from Laili. Um, she says, hi, Rain, I resonate with your story and I'm on the same path. My question is about your marriage. When you met your wife, was she a Baha'i? Did she become a Baha'i? What was it like rediscovering your faith while in a relationship? And how does the Baha'i faith influence your marriage? Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, great question. So when my wife and I got together, we weren't Baha'is. And um, uh, we were boyfriend, girlfriend. And then I started having these struggles and then started looking into religious faith. And that's when I got more involved in the Baha'i faith. So my, my wife was like, what is this? This is weird. Like Baha'is do a fast in March where it's similar to Ramadan. We don't eat or drink from sun up to sundown over the course of 19 days. And one year I decided to do the fast. And my wife was like, what is going on? Is my husband <laughs> joining some weird culty thing? What's happening here? And uh, it took her many years, but uh, about you know, six or seven years later, she became a Baha'i herself. She was always interested in the spiritual path and, um, and in learning about, and, and one half of her family is Jewish, one half of her family is Christian. So she was always a little torn between the two sides, loved both sides, loved both traditions, and found that the Baha'i faith was a, a beautiful way to honor her Jewish faith, her Christian faith, and now a forward looking Baha'i faith. Thank you. Our next question is from Shelby. How will you handle the independent investigation of truth with your own kid? Yeah, thanks. Good question. Boy, whew. Uh, yeah, I have a 16 year old uh, boy and um, he uh, has decided to become a Baha'i at age 15. And um, he's involved in junior youth activities. Um, but he's going to have a, he's going to have a difficult, arduous journey in front of him. There's a lot of 
incredible temptations out there. And I'm not talking about temptations like sex and drugs and rock and roll, although those are very real, but, you know, a temptation to forego spirituality and a spiritual path, kind of like what I did to just focus on career, focus on making money or focus on gaining status or just on dating and relationships or, or kind of mindless distraction. Um, the, the, there's a greed that was referenced in the letter by the Universal House of Justice and um, the greed and materialism that's out there is, uh, is quite daunting. So we try and educate my son around spiritual ideas and spiritual virtues, um, arm him with all of these different tools uh, to try and make himself a better person and try and make the world a better place. But then he's on his own and then he's going to go on his own journey wherever that takes him and um, and we'll pray for him. And he's going to have, I, he's going to have ups and downs. He's going to have tremendous trials and tremendous heartbreak because all of us are. That's kind of the point of life and that's a part of the journey. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of similar questions. So Ashley says, how do you become a Baha'i? I was raised in a Southern Baptist setting and it never felt right. This presentation just clicks with my soul. And then Jessica says, how can I find people practicing the Baha'i faith in my area? Wow, great questions. Um, uh, I don't know. I think you can go to Baha'i.org and there's probably a thing you, that's a, the official Baha'i website. It's a wonderful website. It did a great job and it has uh, wonderful quotes and writings and teachings. And if you want to learn more about history and uh, you can kind of go on that journey. There's also, a, maybe we can put it in the in the text chat here. 1-800-22-UNITE. Um, 1-800-22-UNITE. Can I chat on here? How do I do that? There it is. Send chat to everyone. 1-800-22-UNITE. Um, we'll connect you with Baha'is in your area. Or if you're in a town, just Google like Birmingham, Alabama, Baha'i community. A lot of Baha'is have websites and you can write to the Baha'is there. So, um, and check out Baha'i.org. Uh, and then Baha'iteachings.org is good too. And they, they have a, you can fill out a form there. And there's lots of great articles and information there. Thanks for inquiring. Thank you. Um, Patty asks, does the Baha'i faith have a place of worship where they meet on a regular basis? Uh, great question. So Baha'is don't have like churches or mosques um, uh, or temples or anything like that. Um, there are some communities have a, like a local Baha'i center. Like if you're in Houston, they've like rented a building and it's the Baha'i center. And sometimes they'll have gatherings there, obviously pre and post COVID. Um, but a lot of Baha'i gatherings just take place in the home or in local community centers or rented halls or what have you. Um, there are these Baha'i, wonderful Baha'i houses of worship uh, all over the planet um, that are really gorgeous and we're building more of them. But they're, again, they're not for Baha'is, they're for people of all, um, of all faiths to come together and to worship and to help build community. Thank you. Um, Mary Ellen asks, how do you talk about becoming a Baha'i with a devout Catholic family? Any advice for having courage to follow what you feel called to change religion? Um, boy, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of resources on the web around that. In fact, there was a quote I was going to use today I wonder if I can find it. Um, Abdu'l-Baha says, um, this is a way of looking at um, talking to Roman Catholic family. Um, if we are lovers of the light, we adore it in whatever lamp it may become manifest. But if we love the lamp itself and the light is transferred to another lamp, we'll neither accept nor sanction it. Therefore, we must follow and adore the virtues revealed in the messengers of God. We must not adhere and adore the lamp. We must recognize the sun, no matter from what dawning point it may shine forth. So 
I love this idea that the light of God was contained in Lord Jesus, the Son of God. And the Bible and the Christian way was the spiritual way forward for humanity. And people like to kind of harsh on Christianity a lot and Catholicism a lot, and certainly a lot of evils were done in, the, in its name, but there was tremendous good that also came out of Christianity. Um, it was the first time that people of all different classes, creeds, social classes, races, genders, uh, came together under one umbrella, under one tent. In the early days of Christianity, you had Roman gladiators and and Caesars, and you had prostitutes and slaves, and you had uh, you know Palestinians and Greeks and people of all different tribes, all under one church of loving Jesus Christ, and it was an incredible unifier in a way that had never humanity had never experienced before because it had always been about tribe before that point. And now this light, that same light is in Baha'u'llah. And it's the same message from God, it's the same light coming from God in a different personage. They may not buy it, they may say, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, that's a very difficult struggle. Um, and it may take a long time, and it may take five years, 10 years, 30 years. Um, it's, it's all in your deeds and how you do it with great love, compassion, and gentleness. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kazi asks, what is the view on the afterlife in the Baha'i faith? Are people punished in the afterlife? Um, so are people, yeah, so great question. I wish we had time to do a whole talk on that. Um, I, uh, um, Baha'is are not punished in the afterlife. There's a, there's a very simple analogy Baha'is use all the time. And if Baha'is have heard this before, my apologies. Um, but a baby in the womb is gathering the physical attributes that it needs to function in this world. It's gathering its eyes and ears and its elbows and knees and hair and whatever it needs to function in this world. It doesn't know while it's in the womb that that's why these eyes are growing on the front of its head or why its elbows are growing in that way. It's just content being in the womb. But thank God that we grew all those organs so that we could really fully function uh, to the best of our ability in this physical plane. Baha'is believe that we're doing the same thing on this planet. We're growing our spiritual arms and legs and limbs and eyes and ears and our spiritual versions of that for the use on whatever plane, whatever plane of existence is on the other side. Um, and uh, so these uh, spiritual are the, are the virtues. These are the virtues. Um, they are um, uh, patience, kindness, humility, compassion, love, empathy. That's what we're growing in this world. And that's what we take to the next world. So there isn't a heaven and hell in the Baha'i faith. There's simply taking our spiritual qualities. We leave our earthly qualities. I'll leave my house and I'll leave my Trader Joe's Raisin Bran and uh, I'll just go to the next world, only bringing whatever spiritual qualities I have been able to cultivate in this plane. And I better work harder on the patience one because otherwise I'll be kind of crippled. Forgive the word, I don't mean it in an ableist terminology, but I will be a detriment to me to not have patience in the next world. So my job is to grow my patience in this world. Thank you. And also, I just wanted to say we have a talk on our YouTube channel about the afterlife if you want to check out more about it. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and you, can you tell people about your YouTube channel as well? I, I imagine you will more at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, the name of our YouTube channel is Baha'i Faith Modern Perspectives. So we have talks mm -hmm. up there about different topics in more depth if you want to check it out. Um, the next question is, um, Rain, the Baha'i Faith seems very similar to Hinduism with the level of acceptance it shows. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, it doesn't matter what name you know me by, just that you know me. The Baha'i Faith seems very accepting and spiritual in comparison. Have you noticed these similarities? 
Um, I don't know much about Hindu. I've read the Bhagavad Gita, which is so comparable to so many of the Baha'i writings. It's, it's so comparable to parts of, of the Bible, of the Torah, of the writings of the Buddha. It's so beautiful, but I don't know much about Hindu. And that's wonderful to hear that there's that kind of acceptance uh, happening. Mm -hmm. um, Sultan asks, do the daily prayers of the Baha'i religion discipline your life? I'm asking this as a Muslim because I feel like prayers regulate my life. Thanks for your answer. Uh, that's a beautiful question. And I greatly admire the Muslim rigor and discipline of praying five times a day and surrendering five times a day uh, to Mecca, to something larger than themselves. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful practice. The Baha'is have a daily obligatory prayer. We have three options to say. We can say one three times a day. We can say a very long one. Or you can say a short one between noon and sunset. And um, so uh, the, um, the, yes, I agree. Baha'is also pray, also read holy writings in the morning and in the evening um, of the writings of Baha'u'llah as well. But this Baha'i obligatory prayer is very short. It's only two sentences long. Maybe it's three. And it goes, I bear witness, O oh my God, that thou hast created me to know thee and to worship thee. I testify at this moment to my powerlessness and to thy might, to my poverty and to thy wealth, that there is none other God but thee, the help in peril, the self-subsisting. So we say this prayer that does, just like Sultan said, it refocuses us. We were created to know and worship God. That's what, now, what does that mean to know and worship God? That's very complicated. It doesn't mean to just study about God and, and to pray to God, but to know and worship God, like I said, the creation of art is worship. So I was created to create art because that's worship. Service is worship in the Baha'i faith. The highest form of worship is service in the eyes of God, says Abdul Baha. So knowing God and in the Quran, it says too, to know God is to know thyself. So the more we learn about ourselves, the more we're learning about God. So this goes hand in hand. And there's a lot of questions coming up on the Baha'i view and the LGBTQIA plus community. So that's a very, um, that's a very challenging subject. And I'll just be really direct that Baha'is love and accept everyone. We don't believe that there's any kind of hell whatsoever or fiery punishment awaiting anyone on the other side. We don't even look at like sin in any kind of remotely similar way to Islam and Christianity. Christianity. Um, that our moral teachings are there to guide us and help us grow closer to God. All this being said, there's very, very little written in the Baha'i faith about homosexuality. Um, uh, and it's, it's a long and difficult conversation because we live in a society right now that says, basically, what is the Baha'i writing? The Baha'i writing is that, um, that uh, sex is for a married man and woman. That's the laws that we have in the Baha'i faith. That sex is for a married man and woman. You can interpret that however you want. Um, these moral teachings come from Baha'u'llah as a guideline for us. And so uh, this is something that a lot of Baha'is struggle with, that I struggle with. Some of my, sounds cliche, but so many of my best friends are, uh, uh, you know, LGBTQ communities. My son's godfather is. Um, there's great acceptance and love um, of people of different uh, sexualities, sexual preferences. And uh, Baha'is everywhere fight for social justice. So one of the things you will always see with the Baha'i faith is if anyone in the LGBTQ community is being subjugated in any way, Baha'is will be at the forefront of standing up for their rights and fighting for their rights to 
be who they choose to be and who they want to be. We don't want to see any community subjugated whatsoever. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all of these decisions are between you and between God and um, and require great kind of patience, love, uh, connection, surrender, and uh, Baha'is withhold judgment around any of this stuff. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a tricky conversation because again, I said like in contemporary society, it's like you're either anti or you're totally for. And I would say Baha'is are for, however, we have this moral teaching that was given to us by Baha'u'llah, we believe is divine about sex between a married man and a married woman. So this is a lot of Baha'i struggle with. And thank you for your questions on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this question is about the chart of succession of prophets beginning with Abraham. What about humanity prior to the appearance of the Christian faith? Wait, repeat that again? So this was about the chart you showed with the succession of prophets beginning with Abraham. Yeah. And they're wondering what about humanity prior to the appearance of Oh, yeah. yeah. Great question. So progressive revelation, we are told that there have been thousands of divine messengers that have appeared before recorded history. And there's there's a, an amazing Baha'i named Kevin Locke, a Native American Baha'i, Lakota. And um, he's done work with the great Baha'i scholar, Christopher Buck, on a lot of Native American spiritual traditions that very well could be from a Baha'i um, a, a Baha'i viewpoint of what a messenger of God is or a, a manifestation of God is. Uh, one of them is a woman, white buffalo calf woman, who when you read the teachings and the stories of white buffalo calf woman, um, it's astonishingly like Jesus. It's all about unifying and uh, bringing together and building community, loving and service and and service to the divine. So there have been uh, many divine teachers and there will continue to be. Baha'u'llah says it won't be for another you know, thousand years. So at this point, 900 some years, but there, there will continue to be this divine guidance received from these divine teachers uh, for as long as humanity is alive. Thank you. Um, Amy asks, is the Baha'i faith pro-choice or pro-life? So the Baha'i faith doesn't really take a stance on pro-choice or pro-life. Again, everything in society right now is kind of like for or against and two sides clashing. Baha'is believe that the soul of a baby is uh, created at conception. And uh, so the Baha in that, from that standpoint, uh, abortion would be uh, terminating a life. But that being said, a lot of these decisions are left to the woman who's carrying the, carrying the fetus in consultation with the doctor. And, um, uh, and, you know, that's again, a very, a very tricky conversation because it's, it's so polarizing and the Baha'i faith seeks to walk a kind of, um, a middle ground, but, uh, if so, I don't think Baha'is would ever legislate anti abortion legislation, but at the same time, uh, for an individual Baha'i, they would need to really understand that 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 baby in the womb is is alive and has a soul. And someone said, uh, David Siao says. Since Baha'i religion is finding common ground between different religions, how do Baha'is reconcile the differences then? And that's a great question. Again, I spoke briefly about like how Buddhism and Islam are so different. How would you possibly think they're the same? Well, first of all, so many of these religions, the original writings, there were no original writings. It was all in an oral tradition. And they weren't written down for, even the Bible wasn't written down for 100 to 200 years after Jesus was alive. Um, it was in an oral tradition. A lot can get lost. Um, the same thing happened with Buddhism, and it was hundreds of years before the sayings and teachings of the Buddha were written down. And the, what humanity does is it corrupts this divine message. We don't really know. We have these incredible kernels of teachings from the Buddha, but we don't know exactly what the Buddha taught. It was so long ago. Things weren't written down. So humanity then corrupts um, 
the teachings and makes them his own. And that creates a lot of the differences. But if you go to the source and you read in the Bible, the red line, the red letter Bible, what Jesus says, and then you read what Muhammad says, and you read what Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, and you read what the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, um, then you can play a game where you, you write down their quotes, take their names off, put it in a hat, and someone picks them out, and you won't be able to recognize the difference. You think you will, but you won't. It's a, it's a really fun and remarkable game. So the essential truths are there in all of the world's faiths. And societally, differences have arisen in the hundreds of years since the manifestation of that divine teacher. Thank you. Um, another question from David. Can you please shed more light on the Baha'i concept of sin? Sure. So, um, great, great question. So, uh, the original um, term, the word sin, uh, came from the ancient Greek. And I forget the, um, the term right now. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's, uh, but it's an archery term to miss the mark. So there, and then that was translated into evil uh, later. Um, I forget in which language. Um, but the, or even the original concept of sin is, is an is a archery term to miss the mark. So that if you sin, you're missing the mark. So sin is about the mark. What is the mark? The mark is to be a good person and to try and be your best. And we all are going to make mistakes. And we're going to fall off the wagon. We're going to fall. We're going to get into ruts. We're going to go down the wrong path, fall in with the wrong people, have periods of time that um, we're making mistakes or, or on a daily basis, we're gonna make mistakes. So God understands this. God could have made perfect people populating 7 billion perfect angels on planet earth if that was his plan. But the, the whole idea is to work on making yourself better. So if Baha'i faith has no backbiting as a central teaching, no gossiping as a central teaching, and you gossip, you're not going to hell. Um, you're, you're not doing your soul's growth any favors by gossiping or backbiting. In fact, you're hurting the development of your soul by doing that. I'm looking at you, Baha'is. Um, and, uh, but we keep working at it and we've missed the mark with backbiting, with gossiping, and then we continue to work at it. And that's, that's how sin works. Thank you. Um, I think there was a question just asking when you became a Baha'i. So maybe if you wanted to go into more depth about that. Um, what, what is it? When did you become a Baha'i? Um, I became a Baha'i twice. I'm a born again Baha'i. I, when, when a Baha'i, when a, when a youth is 15 years old, they can decide to become a Baha'i, in which case you sign a card. The only reason you sign a card is so that you can donate to the Baha'i Fund because we don't accept money from outside sources. And so that you can be on the voting rolls and we can vote for our local administrative bodies. So I became a Baha'i at 15, left the faith when I was about 20, um, 21, and then came back in in my early 30s, 32, 33. So it was kind of a twofold process for me. So, um, uh, by the time I started the office in uh, 2004, I had been practicing the Baha'i faith again for about five years at that point. So maybe we should wrap it up. This is a good, this is a good amount of time. Okay. Uh, what, what can, I have something to share with people. Can I, can I say something? Sure. I'm going to be doing some talks for uh, Baha'i Chat, um, and I've got one coming up. I'll put it on my social media, but you can go to Baha'i.chat. Um, I'm going to try and do it, I think, the last, um, wait, Saturday? I thought I was doing it on a Sunday. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it's a Saturday. Um, Saturday, February 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can register at Baha'i.chat. I'm doing another talk, so thank you. 
great. Someone said it's a Sunday, that date, so. Yes, it is. They made a mistake there. That's why I was wondering. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much again. Um, this was actually really helpful and I loved that we had so many different kinds of questions in the chat today. Um, thank you for you know taking the time to come and share your story. So our speaker next week will be Mr. Robert Ahdie and his topic will be A Better Way, the Baha'i Model of Elections. And again, we have these talks every Saturday at noon Eastern time. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat to our YouTube channel and also to our mailing list if you would like to be in our mailing list. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Thanks, everybody.